love you too. Thank you for the plug and the inspiration to practice the first of the six immeasurables, Donna. <laughs> giving, and of course it's not just monetary giving, it's giving of your attention, your love, your time, your affection, your care. Any of that can be Donna, which means generosity. What are the other six perfections? Sometimes Eve mentions a few of them too, so I'll go ahead and say the other five. These are practices of the bodhisattva or the, you know, the aspirant, the spiritual practitioner who, who really takes a vow to awaken for the benefit of themselves and others. And the path includes these six perfections. So the first is dana, generosity. The second is discipline. And the third is uh, patience. Very good one. All of them are good, but that's one of my big challenges. And then the fourth is, um, I like to call it enthusiastic effort. It's um, often translated as uh, diligence. But really the tsundru is the word in Tibetan and it means enthusiastic effort. I think that, that feels a little bit more inspiring than diligence. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the fifth is concentration. And samten in Tibetan, samten, which means meditative stability, concentration. It could be shamatha, it could also be samadhi, but the Tibetan is samten, which literally means meditative concentration. And then the sixth is wisdom, cultivating wisdom, and not just any old wisdom, right? But it's the wisdom that sees into the true nature of reality. That in, when Buddhists talk about wisdom, they're talking about kind of everything under the sun, you know, all forms of wisdom, but specifically what wisdom means is referring to is the wisdom into emptiness, the wisdom into impermanence, into suchness, dharmata, wisdom into the true nature of the impermanent beauty and tragedy all arising and dissolving within this display of our awareness. So that's pretty cool. So Donna is the first, and it really supports the, the Sangha. It, it really does create help to create the fabric for all of us to join together and be together. So the feeding your demons is a really profound practice. It sounds kind of like, why would I want to feed my demons? But it really what it is is, it, is learning to approach our life and our challenges, those things that block our experience of freedom, in a way where we learn to attend to them, feed them rather than fight them. So we feed rather than fight. And this is based on the ancient uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice of chud, which means severance, uh, working with uh, releasing clinging and fixation to our small sense of self, the, the ego, and opening to a greater capacity actually for generosity and compassion and presence. So feeding your demons is kind of a, a modern, what Lama Tsultram, my teacher and the founder, the creator of this feeding your demons practice says it's like chud, which is that ancient practice of severance, dressed in Western clothing. <laughs> it's kind of updated and essen essentialized for Westerners. It's a five-step process that helps us meet, then feed our so-called patterns that block our experience of freedom. We call them demons here, but they could be called anything really. Our neuroses, our, the ways we suffer, the ways we forget. <clears throat> but then we also get to meet our allies, those, those energies uh, within us really. I mean, these aren't things out there. These aspects of ourselves that help guide us, that help us see the truth, that he help us heal. These are the allies. And so art is a very interesting way to work with them because as Jung, Carl Jung said, the subconscious communicates through imagery. And so as we're meeting the demon, feeding the demon, and then later meeting and dialoguing with the ally, uh, we, we can pause and actually sketch the imagery that's coming up. And what we'll do in this series, this four-part series that does start tomorrow, is we will, you'll be guided in the practice of feeding your demons, and then you'll get to go deeper into the art making as an extension of the healing potential and the healing gestalt, you could say, of the practice of feeding, not fighting. 
So it's this course is geared for people who already have a foundational understanding of feeding your demons because we're going to kind of dive right in. That means you've read the book or you've taken one of my classes. It could be one of these hour and a half classes. It doesn't have to be a big retreat or deep training. Just people who have a basic understanding of it so we can dive right in and go deeper. So all that's on my website. I don't know if Pamela or Mace could paste that. That'd be great. Oh, you did. Okay, good. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say before we dive into meditation is that I've been, you know, really uh, feeling and um, praying for uh, our Asian American brothers and sisters and Pacific Islanders who have been experiencing an increased level of aggression and violence during COVID time. Of course, it's not new. It's always it's been there for a long time. And this recent occurrence of uh, eight people being killed in Atlanta, it just I just feel like I would be remiss if I didn't bring this to our attention since Buddhism is an Asian-based religion. We give thanks to the cultures who've brought this wisdom to us. And so I'd like to just paste one article that I found helpful that points to ways that we can help. Um, AAPI or Asian American Pacific Islanders, our dear community. Uh, we're all brothers and sisters on this global Sangha. And if Buddhism isn't helping us feel the truth of that, then I don't know, maybe you've got to find a better teacher, <laughs> a better teaching. Um, you know, we're all, we're all here together and we can't just sit on our mountaintop, right? We can do some mountaintop. But we've also got to go down into the valley and be uh, of some service, however large or small. And this could be one little drop in the bucket that I'd like to offer to you all about ways that we can help. If you're not already helping, I'm sure a lot of you are already doing that. I'm probably preaching to the choir. <laughs> so <clears throat> if anybody has other important resources, they could just probably put those in the chat. I don't know if you've disabled the chat function or not, but um, I'd love to hear hear from you too. So what do you guys want to do tonight? Do you want to do Donglen again? Do you want to do some shamatha, settling the mind in its natural state? Settling the mind in its natural state? Yeah, yeah, big thumbs up. We can end with some compassion, like a compassion prayer. You know, always I love to end with the heart. Well, begin with the heart too, and the heart basically is pumping throughout the whole thing. Of course, you know, in my in my experience, mindfulness comes from a place of love. It's infused with love. It's not separate or divorced from it. That quality of slowing things down. And claiming your space, taking a breath, and being in the moment is a loving act. It's a loving gesture. It's infused with love. So the heart, you know, some people say, oh, mindfulness is fine, but <clears throat> what about the heart? You know, I think that peop people don't, perhaps aren't being taught to understand that the heart's always there in all of our practices. You know, it's not one thing and then the other. So let's go ahead and jump in. We'll start with um, kind of our normal, we'll do bodhicitta, arousing a heartfelt motivation to be a benefit. And then we'll do some breath awareness. So we'll ground and center the mind. It's kind of like a gentle harnessing of the attention strands that have been disparate throughout the day. This is gently bringing them into the central channel more, you know, the central axis through the breath. And then we'll open the eyes to settle the mind in its natural state, a more dzogchen, or great perfection, um, approach to cultivating meditative stability, or samten. We call it samten. It's also called shine in Tibetan, which is shamatha in Sanskrit. These are just words. <laughs> I'm a linguist, so I can get excited by words. But the main thing, like the great Daikinis taught all the erudite male scholars in the monasteries, there are all these stories of 
these celibate monks who are so studious and think they're so wise, having visitations by old hags or, you know, dakinis, you know, wisdom, feminine expressions of uh, embodied awareness in various forms saying, testing them. Do you understand the words or the meaning? And then if they said, oh, I understand the words, there's one story of, of a great old hag doing a jig and real happy that he said the truth. This is a story of um, <coughs> Naropa. But then he saw, oh, well, she's so happy. You know, I've got to just give her a little more. So I also understand the meaning, Naropa said to the old hag. And at that moment, she threw down her walking stick and berated him and said, you're lying. You only understand the words. In order for you to understand the meaning, you have to go on pilgrimage and find your guru. <laughs> and he realized that she was right. So he left the monastery and went on his, I think some stories say 12-year pilgrimage, 12-year search for his teacher, Talopa. Oh, there's some great stories. Naropa's biography is worth reading. It's kind of ancient Indian lore of the tantric adepts, moving from the celibate controlled life to integrating all life's sorrows and happiness into the path of awakening. And that's what Lojong is. Really, Lojong is about meeting all the sorrows and all the joys and with as much mindfulness infused with love as we can possibly muster in the moment, welcome those things, those so-called demons into our life. So let's practice with meditation because practicing meditation helps us integrate this into our life. So allow your eyes to close. And take some deep breaths, this gentle turning inward uh, is the first expression of love, loving kindness for yourself. You deserve this. You are important here. And now, in a more essence heart language, bring forth a heart prayer of bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening, your heartfelt deepest wish to awaken for the benefit of all beings. Let it be a feeling, not a thought. And then yet again, turning to the breath and the body. Receiving each in-breath as if it were a gift from the divine, a gift from the universe. Nourishing your body. And the out-breath is a, another gift offered from within to the world, a release. The in-breath is a receiving, the out-breath is an offering filled with blessings. And I'm going to go tell my 12-year-old to turn it down.
And with the out-breath, feel a releasing of all the weight that you carry through your day, through your week, your life. Sometimes I even take my hands and place them on my lap or on the floor and offer that weight back to the earth. Melting that weight off of the face, the shoulders, the neck, the back. Offering anything that feels too heavy. Offering it to the earth. Let it carry that for a while now. So that you can replenish yourself and enjoy a quality of spaciousness, perhaps of feeling more light and buoyant as the subtle body awakens to the gift of the breath. Feeling the texture, the flow, the temperature of the breath as it flows in and out of the body. Letting the mind ride the gentle, subtle sensations of the breath as it flows in and out. Releasing distraction with the out-breath, coming back again and again. Cultivating this shine calm abiding, abiding in stillness with the body still like a mountain, the mind spacious like the sky. And the breath flowing freely like a cool summer breeze. first ingredient for meditation is a large dose of relaxation. Release any remaining tension and settle the body in its natural state. Still, relaxed, aligned with gravity. Settling the speech in its natural state is nuanced in that, yes, it is a silence without reciting mantra, prayers, without speaking. But the speech also refers to the breath. So settling the breath in its natural state without control, just enjoying the natural breath like a sleeping baby, a rise and fall of the abdomen, And if the mind feels flighty, distracted, a helpful tool is to insert a quiet internal count at the top of each breath. 
You can count from 1 to 21. If you find you're distracted and lost count, just start again. And we'll do so in silence. Just at the top of the in-breath, count 1. Release the counting as you breathe out the top of the next breath, a gentle two, release, riding the flow of the breath, release distraction with as soon as it arises. Relax the jaw and the face. And then releasing the counting is just a, like a training wheel. Yet stay aware of the breath. So in a sense, we've been training the horse, the wild steed of the mind through counting and breath awareness. Perhaps we've 
run circles in the corral of mindfulness to maintain a certain quality of presence and concentration. And now we're going to open the gate and allow the wild steed of the mind to roam freely in the vast open pastures. This is the settling the mind in its natural state phase where rather than controlling with techniques, counting or labeling, we allow the mind a vast open space in which to roam. And the only technique is to release grasping, to release distraction by releasing that fixation of following the mind, following the thoughts. So allow the eyes to open and gaze at a comfortable angle past the tip of the nose. Relax the muscles behind and around the eyes. and soften the gaze as if you could see a full 360 degrees around you. And with the eyes gently open, there's a quality of vast space that actually the mind does not just live within the skull, that our awareness pervades space. And within that space or domain of the mind, thoughts bubble up and pass and dissolve, like clouds forming and dissolving within the space of the sky. And rather than trying to constrain or train or control the mind, we let it roam freely in the pastures of the space of the mind. And allow the mind to settle in its natural state, limpid, clear, wakeful, From time to time, you can anchor the awareness with a deep breath, but apart from that, release any control with the breath. The natural state is limpid, clear, luminous, imbued with cognizance. not contorted and twisted around small temporal thoughts, this, that, preferring, or rejecting. Just release those as you feel them arise within this vast space of the mind. They're just energy, knots of bliss. Let them unravel and release and settle the mind in its natural state.
with the jaw of East Lad, the muscles of the face soft. Notice if the chin has come forward, draw it gently back towards the center of the throat, elongating the base of the skull and the neck. And then feel how the breath enlivens the belly. Releasing all forms of either subtle or gross grasping as you breathe out. Feeling the three primary qualities of shamatha, calm abiding, of relaxation, stability, and clarity living within you now. If you feel drowsy, you can raise the gaze a little, take a deep breath, sit up more straight, turn up the internal brightness. And if the mind is scattered and agitated, hyperactive, release into relaxation with the outbreath. Relax any thought of I am doing this, I am that. Let the I unravel with the outbreath and feel the quality of presence, of simply being rather than doing.
Andra, do you need assistance? You want to mute? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good. Sorry about that. That's okay. All good. All good. So now we're going to shift into some heart language. I'd like to spend the last maybe five minutes of our meditation in another form of shamatha, which we don't do very often. It's called mantra recitation. Mantra is one of the shamatha techniques. So we blend our awareness with the sound of the mantra that we resonate within ourselves. So what's nice is that you're in a group, but because you're all muted, you'll just hear my voice, and then you'll get to hear your voice, letting your voice resonate in the space and within you. And this mantra is the compassion mantra of Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum means Om, the universal sound of consciousness. Mani means jewel. Padma is lotus. Padme is in the lotus. Hum is the essence seed syllable of enlightened mind. This is the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of compassion. So we can recite this with heart blessings for those in need, spreading prayer and love in all directions, those under violence, oppression, suffering of all forms. Our heart language travels throughout all of space on the waves of this mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Om Mani Padme Hum Oh, mani padme hung. Oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme hung. Oh, mani padme hung. Oh, mani padme hung. Oh, mani padme ho. Oh, mani padme hung. Om Mani Padme Hum. Oh 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 Mani Padme Hum. Mani Padme Hung. Oh, 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 Mani Padme Ho, oh, oh, Mani Padme Ho, 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 Oh, Mani Padme Hum. 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 Oh, M
पद में हो माने पद में हो ओ माने पद में हो ओ माने पद में हो Now recite it like the buzzing of the bees in a meditative vibrational way. Om mani padme hum om mani padme hum mani padme hum om mani padme hum om mani padme hum mani Om mani padme hum om mani padme hum om mani padme hum om mani padme hum mani padme hum Om 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 mani
a system on my own. I'd totally be floundering in the ocean of samsara. So we have our karmic heritage and we have our ancestral, right, biological heritage. And it's good to acknowledge both. They're both important. So you might have some karma with this, you know? If you have an affinity for contemplation, for meditation, for mantra, for devotion, it's okay. But just respect it and respect where it comes from. That's why my teacher said, learn the language. Yeah. Learn the language. Learn Tibetan. Learn Sanskrit. Then you'll really understand dharma on a deeper level. Of course, the essence of dharma lies behind the words. You don't have to learn that. But there's something really profound in those words that carry the meaning. But the most important way to honor these traditions is to put them into practice, to bring them alive within you, not within me or her or him or them, in you. Don't put it off. Okay. I want to I want to hear your wisdom. <laughs> I've been What about you? How is it coming alive in you? I want to know. Like let's get real and stop pretending to be what we're not. That's what meditation's all about. Let's get real. Meditation. Get real. Leanne is raising her hand. Or Leanne, please. I don't know. Yeah, you can undo it. Good. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sharing wisdom, however. I'm asking. That's all right. Yours. Okay. You share your confusion, too, and your delusion. It's all although, welcome here. <laughs> although I will share something that made me laugh during meditation. Oh, I, love, I, I love laughter. I had I had such my monkey mind today, and at, at some point I was meditating, and I caught my the like two things I caught myself meditating on were I really need to learn to speed read, and I'm and like how can I play the stock market better? <laughs> and then I thought, wow, talk about grasping! <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not what we are doing right now. Thank you for acknowledging that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking of Bitcoin? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm learning how to invest this, this month. So uh, it's, it's yeah. on my mind. It's a cosmic joke. And it's good. That, I love your humor, Leanne. Don't lose that, right? So the humor is the best medicine because you're like, oh, there I am again. <laughs> yes, Funny. I do, I do we don't want the serious disease. We want to have a light touch. It um, is funny. It is really funny what we find in there. Go ahead. It's yeah. No, the mind, my mind is hilarious. Would that I could project it for you all to have a good laugh. Boy, you're lucky. We don't all have that talent. <laughs> um, my question is, I've been thinking this for a while because I've developed a daily practice since November. And um, I guess I have two questions. One is, is like today, the, you know, I just, the mind was sort of all over the place. And I understand that's part of the work and we show up how we are and it's different every time. But I have found myself wondering like, all right, I don't know that I'm necessarily quote unquote improving in terms or deepening, right? That, and or that maybe there's a plateau. And I guess I'm just curious in the way that I'm like, well, I'm using my kettlebell, but I bet there's a smarter way to exercise. Like, how do, what is the smart way if you really want to get to deeper meditative states and really make sure that you're on a continuous, you know, without the grasping and all of it, but smart meditating or whatever terminology you want to use. I guess I'm just, would like some guidance on that and whether it's related to frequency of, in terms of the day, because I do it only once or how long you meditate. And then I guess just related to that, I know people talk a lot about doing it first thing in the morning and, mm -hmm. um, I often don't like to start the day that way. It's sort of a middle of my day thing. And I just, again, I'm sure there's no one way, but curious about mm -hmm. if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. 
I'm going to give you, I'm going to answer this from two angles. I'm in a way I'm going to answer it from the obvious angle, the obvious Buddhist angle, which is like release striving. There is no goal. <laughs> the path is the goal. As soon as you notice the mind saying, how can I get better? Recognize that as a striving mind and release back into the moment. Okay. All of that's true. Right. So you know that, right, Leanne? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Completely. You got it. And. Okay. <laughs> now there's some practical tips I can give you. <laughs> um, frequency surpasses duration. Now I used to say frequency trumps duration, but my friend said, could we not use Trump in words right now? I'm still PTSD. So I'm trying not to say it, but it's a cute phrase. Frequency surpasses or trumps duration with anything you're trying to learn. So whether it's a language, a new art form, piano, music, meditation, a little bit in a frequent way is better than a lot less frequently. So find your magic time, whether it's lunch break, middle of the day, right before bed, first thing in the morning, whatever works for you, and do a, a little bit. Like, and quit while you're enjoying it. I love that advice. Like, don't drag it on to the point where you're falling asleep or you're hating it and then stop and think, you know, okay, well, I stuck that out. You're not going to want to sit back down, right? If the end of the last practice was a bore. So in the beginning, even five minutes, set a little timer if that helps you. And just be content and like when it's end, when it's good. And well, when just, you're like, oh, I feel good. I don't want to end. <laughs> so I've yep. got the frequency. I'm not consistent. I don't know if you're saying consistency. Consistency. Matters. In terms of what time, but it's been daily since November. Good. Okay. Yes, the frequency is there and then it's the like, frequency okay. is there. Okay, good. A lot of people struggle with that. So you're already a step ahead. That's great. And so that's come, where that question is coming from. You're exactly. frequent, okay, but I'm you're not really feeling like right. you're progressing. Yeah. Retreat, my dear. I can't I can't tell you. There's nothing like retreat. It will change your life. Have you done retreat? I've done two year a couple of years ago. Um, uh -huh. but it's been a while and I didn't develop a regular practice after that. So mm. I feel like I'm in a different place for it now. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all have our seasons. Yeah. If you can get into a longer retreat, a week, a ten day, a two week, a month, whatever your situation can allow once a year at least it's really good it's really good to reset the system and to re-inspire the deeper knowing and um, capacities to open there's nothing like the stillness that a retreat brings as you as you know mm -hmm. another thing to feel like you're building is to extend like if you normally practice let's say for a half hour every day choose one day a week where you increase it by 15 minutes 10 or 15 minutes so push you know push the envelope a little bit more mm -hmm. on a Saturday or a Sunday when you have time thank you yeah and I hope that's consistency helpful. of time is important like the same time of day always or that's not it's helpful for developing habits but don't get too rigid Leanne don't get too rigid with it but you got to have that quality of you know the, the story of the Buddha giving the musician instruction on how to meditate no and the buddha said you know when you're tuning your your sitar what do you do and the musician said well i don't i don't tune them too tight or too loose and the buddha said that's how you meditate so just maintain you know you've got it seems like you've got good discipline right so now for you your vigilance or your your kind of introspective quality will be um, detecting laxity or excitation. Okay, so now in terms of your actual meditation practice, everyone, this is like shamatha 101. Shamatha is concentration practice. It leads to vipassana, deep insight. With shamatha, you can really go in any direction. It's like your foundation. It's like having a good foundation in the house. It itself won't lead you. I mean, they say that it won't lead you to total liberation because you still have got the karmic seeds that are in there. It's vipassana that takes you all the way because the insight into the empty nature of the mind, of phenomena, of thought, reality, it's like it burns up 
or dissolves the seeds of karmas that keep us entrenched in samsara. So, but shamatha is the foundation, and that's what we're focused mostly on in this class. And so, and that can naturally lead to vipassana, and sometimes they're kind of commingling. It's not like a clear line between the two, often. Having said that, in classic shamatha teaching of developing meditative concentration, we use the two faculties of mindfulness and introspection. Dren is mindfulness in Tibetan. Zhejin is introspection. These are the two kind of, your two arms, your two tools. So mindfulness is about 85% of your awareness, suffusing your your moment to moment meditative awareness mindfulness in the moment jejin or introspection is about 15 percent of your my mental you know domain and that is like what alan wallace says it's like posting the sentry at the gate of the castle it wa- it, it detects if you know a thief has come in or someone's trying to escape you could say it's it detects the distracting thoughts oh there's thinking of the bitcoin okay distraction label it or whatever you want to do just release it and then come back to the breath or whatever is your anchor the sentry detects movement distraction and then you release and you come back So that's mindfulness and introspection. So you're developing those qualities within you. And then you're also, uh, what introspection also does is from time to time checks up on on you. Like, how are you doing? Are you sinking into laxity called uh, jingwa in Tibetan? Such a cool word. Can everybody say it? Jingwa. J-I-N-G-W-A. Jingwa. It's a sinking quality of laxity, dullness, like drifting into sleep almost, that just a blob, meditating, spaced out. So introspection, that sentry posted at the gate of mindfulness, detects if you're sinking. Or, on the other hand, if you're getting lost in gupa, which is distraction, like So one is a heaviness, and the other is a light, fiery, spinning, thinking, thinking. Sounds like you were a bit more in the gupa, right, Leanne, today? And so introspection detects that. If If you detect that you're sinking into dullness, then you may recall I gave you instruction. If you feel that you're dull, lethargic, distracted, heavy, then check your posture. You can raise the gaze, allow a little more light in. Take a deep breath and kind of like the image is like turning up the the dial, like the light dial within you, kind of brighten the internal atmosphere. (sighs) Yeah. And then on the other hand, if you find that you're lost in excitation, release into more relaxation. Relax the trying or the fixing or the spinning. Relax. Again, using the breath. Feel that melting away with the out-breath and return to your anchor. So those are kind of basic. There are nine, actually there are nine stages of shamatha practice. And so maybe I could share, maybe in the next time I'll try to remember. We can weave this into our teaching so that you really have a sense there is a map here. This isn't just la-la land, a vague, watered-down Western version of mindfulness meditation practice. It's very specific and very old, ancient, tried-and-true technique. So I hope that helps. That'll give you some ways to detect what's going on and and kind of like self-diagnose. Make sure that you're kind of moving along in the right trajectory, not just hovering or floating. Okay, is that good? I see Lindsay has her hand raised. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah. so- something you said um, was really moving and I, I just started crying and it was because um, you were talking about the two different kinds of ancestry 
and you know, your biological heritage and then your karmic heritage. And I was thinking about how when I first came to Buddhist practice, um, it was in many years ago in grad school when I was a teaching assistant for a Buddhist studies course. Mm -hmm. And I had held myself back from actually practicing Buddhism because I felt as a white person, there was basically no way for me to do it. I mean, what I saw around me struck me as kind of gross appropriation. And I felt sort of like, I can't participate in that. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I ended up teaching for that class three times and the like sustained reading um, was too beautiful for me to not work with. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just thinking about when you said that um, that is part, these, these teachings done with respect, practiced with respect and love um, is the greatest respect for the teachings and, and how it's part of our our own personal um, ancestry, it made me feel both. I think the reason I started crying was because it felt like that's my home. It's not this thing out there that I have to pursue um, and get into that mind state of like, oh, I need to meditate. Oh, I haven't meditated today. I, I got to do this thing. Um, it it made me really feel like at home in the teachings and that they they it's, it's not about pursuit. It's about just being with them. So I really appreciated you saying that. Thank you, Lindsay. That's beautiful. Yeah, there's a quality. I think a lot of us may we can really feel ourselves in you and your story and your words here because, you know, we find our way home in various ways. And, and sometimes we don't feel at home in our family or our culture. I definitely didn't feel that American culture was my my home, you know. I didn't like what <laughs> they want me to believe in this capitalist culture. Like I want to get free, and I had to go over there. I had to go to India to find that and study with Tibetans, and you know, there's something in there that's um, it's good to acknowledge that yes. There is wisdom in my ancestry too, but it didn't really feel like home to me. So there's some truth in that karmic heritage as well. And, and really the ultimate, like, okay, Leanne, you really feel like you've arrived, like you're getting somewhere, when the whole like dualistic mind of like, I have to practice, I have to do good, I have to get kudos, or I'm not saying you're doing that, but we were taught to improve ourselves and to get the good grades. But the real masters, they're meditating all the time, right? There's no differentiation between the seated practice and the cooking practice. This I've mentioned this this beautiful text. You could search this out. It's a, it's a, it's quite deep this text, but I think anyone, even beginners, can access. It's called Buddhahood without meditation. So, it's it's about recognizing the nature of your own mind in every moment and as soon as the mind is thinking i'm meditating here's my laxity here's the excitation here's the drenpa and the shation all of our labeling you're not in it you know you're posturing you're you're trying to be in it but you're not actually in it oh. that's the dzogchen way dzogchen is very kind of zen and natural like it, the path should get easier as you go further, as you mature. It shouldn't get more complicated. <laughs> That's what one of my lamas said. Like, as you get more mature and move along the path, all the strictures and structures start to fall away, and you're actually left in this natural beauty of just a knowing. That's when you know it's happening, you know. Okay, and one more answer to Leanne's question. You know when the heart is feeling more connected, more empathetic, more compassionate, less rigid, less isolated. That's the Tonglen and the Lojong. It's really, remember in the last class I said, you really know the practices are working on you if you're feeling less self-cherishing and more other-cherishing, more cherishing for all beings, more care. Okay, Samir has a hand raised, and then I am going to get to our slogan tonight in the last 10 minutes. So let's spend a few minutes together, Samir, and then, and then I'm going to do our 
Lojong slogan? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. I had an observation and then I had a question. Um, okay. I just wanted to uh, react to what Leanne said and, um, and say that I was uh, very in a very similar space. Um, nine months ago when I uh, was in my last um, SFDC uh, session, and I brought up that exact same question <laughs> to the teacher that day, and I forget his name now, but um, his response was, and basically I said, I, I hadn't been practicing for a while. The, the previous time that I'd done it, um, I felt I hadn't made any progress and it, I just couldn't keep going because I was feeling like what's happening next. Um, and I said, that's my state, that's where I am. Um, and his response to me was to recommend a book. Uh, well, his first response was, okay, let's just start again. Like, just start doing it again. That's it. That's the only thing he, he was like, that's all I'm going to say. Just start again. Uh, and then he said, uh, then he recommended a book uh, called Mindfulness Illuminated. Um, and I found that really helpful. Um, something about he, the way he, the reason he recommended it he, is he said that he saw, he felt that I, I was someone who could benefit from something being laid out in very specific steps. Uh, and the book lays it out that way. Um, and it was very uh, helpful. And I started that, you know, right the very next day I started and I haven't stopped since then, since last July, basically. Um, so, you know, if maybe that's helpful to you, I, I just wanted to share that it was very um, helpful to me and also acknowledge that <laughs> it only happened because I attended a, an SFDC class um, nine months ago. And my question that came up for me in today's discussion was um, there was a lot of, um, there, were, there was a lot of terminology, which um, uh, what I couldn't, it wasn't, I, I wasn't able to really connect with it uh, today. And I was wondering, is there like, what's the way in which um, I can learn more about um, some of these concepts? Like um, when we, when you, Chandra, where you're talking about noticing that the mind is grasping and I, I couldn't quite tell if what was happening in my mind was grasping or not grasping. Mm. Um, so there's, there was stuff like that, which um, I wondered, like, you know, how could I become more, I guess, connected to um, sort of the language, perhaps, uh, you know, just understanding what, um, what are all the ways in which I could be engaging with my mind that, that, you know, people are speaking to. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a good, it's a wonderful thing you brought up, the, the, the word grasping. It's so interesting because it's a, it's a very common word used in meditation instruction with the Buddhism because it's like the natural, it's like the glue that the, the mind glues onto or clings onto or like static cling onto thoughts, perceptions, feelings that arise within our awareness, the field of awareness. And so one pre one emphasis of meditation is to release that knee jerk reaction to form to kind of cling on to thought as a thing and release and release and release and continue to open into a more expansive awareness so that's what the grasping is the tibetan word is zin zin d z i n and it's this quality of holding literally like holding or grasping it could also be clinging. And um, really what the Lojong teachings share with us is that, um, that, that what we're trying to do through meditation and compassion practices like this is that we're um, uh, relinquishing or letting go of that habitual pattern of the mind to zin, to grasp and solidify thought, solidify perception. Because all of these thoughts, feelings, sensations, they're actually not really things, right? They're arising, passing, and dissolving. They're tendril. They're, co they're dependent arising events. They're not actually one thing. It's like they're not nouns. They're verbs in the sense where they're for forever kind of forming and deforming, dissolving. And so if you can have a visceral somatic experience of the letting go of the zin or the grasping, then that opens you to a more spacious, vast experience of consciousness. One book that's good for that is Alan Wallace's book called, um, uh, oh, 
he's got a lot. There's one called Embracing Mind that's very good by B. Allen Wallace, Embracing Mind, which is interesting because it's like grasping mind, but it's more like turning towards the mind and working with the mind is what he means by this. He does a very good job at articulating this kind of fun mind and its functions. So you could get more there. Um, He's written many books, but that, that one comes to mind first. And thank you for your book recommendation. That's a wonderful book. I, I, I agree that Mindfulness Illuminated is a very fine book. Thank you for recommending that. But really, any book on meditation can, can teach you these terms of... Um, these common terms used, like, like grasping or... Uh, mindfulness, introspection. It really, where I'm coming out of is more of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, which is very much based on the sutras and the tantras coming from Indian, India. Um, but it might some of the use of the languaging might sound a little different than what one would find in more Vipassana or Theravada-based traditions or Zen-based traditions as well. But there's a lot of overlap. There's more similarity than there is difference. Okay, let's take the last uh, time we have together for the third slogan, I mean the 33rd slogan, uh, in our Lojong slogan uh, teachings here, mind training teachings, of within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, the great vehicle tradition of Buddhism. And this one is, don't bring things to a painful point. <laughs> So we're kind of like in the Ten Commandments phase of the Lojong slogan, which might not sound very exciting, but this is like daily. This is like advice for living your life. A lot of this is probably already familiar to us, but it's an interesting, uh, interesting slogan. Another translation of this is, don't strike a vulnerable point. The Tibetan is, nela mi bap. Nela mi bap. It means don't push on or fall upon a, a painful uh, spot. So it's actually kind of, kind of like a martial arts, uh, or not martial arts, but like a medicinal, you could say, uh, teaching. Uh, another way of translating that Zigar Kongtarumshe uses is don't pounce upon vulnerabilities. And then I'll give you another one because there are many different ways that Tibetan translators have massaged this into a meaning that Westerners can connect with in English. And this one's very good. Don't go for the throat. <laughs> it's like don't go for the jugular. And so essentially, and the most straightforward interpretation of this uh, slogan is explained by a really great teacher from the, I believe, the 16th century, Jamgun Kongtrul, Tibetan master. He says, in essence, this means don't speak in a way that causes pain for others, either by making pointed remarks or, or exposing their faults. So, you know, pretty straightforward. But I want to tease out in our last few minutes here something that's very interesting related to the, the choice of um, translation around vulnerabilities, like don't pounce upon vulnerabilities or don't strike a vulnerable point. So as I'm talking, think about how this might translate into your life. Like in martial arts, especially uh, martial arts that stem from the uh, Indian tradition of uh, Kalari, which is one of the most ancient forms of martial arts in the world, uh, found in South India, and very much based on the ancient healing wisdom of Ayurveda. We can understand this in a more martial arts vein in terms of what are called the marma points, or these vital junctions that can either bring life or death, depending on how you strike them or touch them or massage or heal them. And so these, these ne in Tibetan are these vulnerable points 
are very interesting and we all have them, right? With an emotional body, we have marma points, these vital junctions within our emotional body, but also within our physical body. So in this sense, faults or vulnerabilities are like the emotional equivalent of marma points, these vital junctions, where when they're struck in certain ways can either bring injury or death or can in, uh, protect or enliven us depending on which way that they are treated or touched. And what they're working with is the vital life force, right? So marma points are junctures where things can get caught or things can open and flow. So whether it's a massage or acupressure type movement or touch or even martial arts where there's a certain intelligence and technique of striking these points uh, depends on the outcome. And... um, I was talking to my husband about this, and he's an Ayurvedic practitioner and a Chinese medical doctor. And he said, I said, what are some of the most important marma points? I mean, we learn them in, in the yoga tradition as well. And he said, well, look at the heart. The heart is one of the major marma points. It depends on how, how like if, if you strike it in a forceful way, it can cause cardiac arrest if done with intelligence. So that's not intelligence, but with certain effectiveness from the martial artist tradition or if it's nourished and and cultivated and loved or heal you know healed through various modalities or herbs it can bring life so the heart is a marma point we have marma points all over the body but also in terms of don't strike the vulnerable points thinking about ways that we either do this to ourselves, like always <laughs> beating ourselves up or being critical towards others or knowingly or unknowingly kind of striking vulnerable points in someone because we're jealous or we're angry or we're hurt in some way. So essentially this this slogan is about mindfulness, knowing when those impulses come up, whether it's towards oneself or towards another, recognizing that, remembering the teachings, that bring us to a sense of care and compassion. And then using our judgment of how to speak. You know, there are times when striking a vital point can be effective. But we have to bring in a mindfulness and a care to that to make sure that it's not destructive. And so... In Donglen, for example... We train in compassion, and even for our, we train in compassion even for our so-called demons. Right? We we're talking about feeding your demons earlier, these so-called enemies. But as you've learned in the earlier classes, with the lens of lojong of mind training and donglen, our so-called demons or our enemies are actually our greatest teachers. We can practice when we meet those dynamics energies within ourselves or out there and that those triggers are actually like our emotional marma points so I'd like to close with a quotation from uh, one of my teachers Lama Tsultram in reference to these vulnerable places these so-called demons within us she writes when difficulties come up in our lives We can see them either as obstacles or as grist for the mill that has potential to bring us closer to awakening. Without these challenges and without recognizing our own faults, we would spend our lives waiting for ideal circumstances instead of genuinely working on ourselves. In fact, our enemies, those who bring up the most in us, are our greatest teachers. And instead of seeing them as demons, we could see them as gifts. And so this is really radical compassion. And we really get to try this out in our life with our colleagues, with our family, with our politicians, with the world, 
and really see how it feels. So that concludes our evening. And Eve will be with you next week for the next slogan. I hope that this brought some benefit for you and the world in some way. Let's take a moment to dedicate the positive energy that we've cultivated here together. Feel it ripple out in all directions. Dedicating for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you so much for your practice, for your time. And I'll see you at the end of the month for Feeding Your Demons. Or if you want to join me, there's still room in the class tomorrow for Art and Feeding Your Demons. Okay, thank you SFDC. Don't forget to make an offering if you can. Every little thing counts, even if it's just a few dollars, it adds up. And there's a link to offer that in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mace and Pamela, Noam, and Jason for hosting. Take care. I'm back.